All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, uh, like uh, Lizzie mentioned, my name is Axel. I'm uh, presenting my minor thesis, actually. So I presented this uh, about a month ago. I just finished my minor thesis. So this is my seminar from uh, completing everything at RMIT. Um, just curious, is any of my assessors here? <laughs> you have to tell me. OK, good. So I can like relax and give you the true story and everything. Um, all right. So just a as an aside, um, I've been to a few of these MLA MLAI meetups uh, before. Uh, I presented at one before back in 2017. I don't know if any of you are uh, at that one that was talking about uh, Alpha Zero and Alpha Go and those like chess and Go playing uh, bots out of DeepMind. So that was a few years ago. And even before, ages, ages, ages ago, I feel like I'm getting old, I actually went to the very first MLAI meetup at Loop Bar, I think it was. Did anybody go to that? It's like 2015? No, OK, just me. Um, if any of you know Andy Kitchen, he sort of made it. And he presented at the first, first night back then. And he was talking about, uh, you know, like word to vec and like, you know, uh, digit pattern recognition and stuff like that. And with just come so far in just like such a short amount of time. It's absolutely crazy. Um, anyway, so uh, I started my thesis a few years ago, back in 2020, uh, right as COVID started to happen. So I could like sit at home and study, um, which was v very convenient. Uh, and the last about year and a half have sort of been working on this minor thesis on uh, generalization and reinforcement learning. Um, just before I start as well, has anybody sort of, who's familiar with the term reinforcement learning? Okay, a few of you, cool, great, okay, cool. Um, there's been a whole bunch of successes in the uh, last few years, um, but shout out to my supervisor, Michael Dan. He's uh, been extremely helpful and he's, in my opinion, like the smartest guy when it comes to RL, at least in Melbourne. So um, if you're an academic and ever wanna collaborate with an RL expert, shout out to him. Um, so here are some examples. If you're not familiar with sort of reinforcement learning already, it's like a paradigm to teach computers how to learn to do a task. So here are some of the success stories. Uh, I already mentioned sort of AlphaGo, a Go playing uh, agent. That was, I think, back from 2017. You've probably seen the documentary on YouTube. Um, before that was uh, mastering uh, Atari games. I think that was back in 2014 slash 15. And heads up, hands up if you've seen the you know, uh, 2015 paper or, or these uh, Atari agents playing pretty well. Because this is what kind of blew my mind back in 2015. These systems learned how to play uh, Atari games. And I just couldn't believe it. Just from pixels, they were, they were learning to do these things. Amazing. And uh, one of my heroes, uh, Lillian Wang, who's the, she just got promoted at like safety officer at OpenAI. Um, she worked on this paper like 100 years ago, 2019 or something. Uh, they were doing, uh, OpenAI actually in general are really, well at least were really interested in reinforcement learning. And this was uh, them getting a robot to learn how to solve a Rubik's cube using reinforcement learning. Um, the, Interesting part of it was they were simulating uh, the robot manipulation of the Rubik's Cube and it learned just by simulation and then it could transfer all the knowledge into the real world, which was pretty cool. It was called Sim2Real. Um, anyway, reinforcement learning is cool. Today I'm going to focus on generalization though. That was what I was interested in for uh, my minor thesis. Um, generally speaking, um, when we talk about generalization, we're talking about using the, your knowledge of some task and having it be transferable to other similar tasks. Okay, so humans generalize very, very well in general. If you learn how to drive in Melbourne, you can probably also drive in Sydney as an example. Okay, and there is a lot of evidence to show that these deep RL systems are actually quite bad at generalizing and I'll show you some examples soon. All right, so for those of you who don't know what reinforcement learning is, this is sort of the general paradigm or framework, I should say. You have an agent, the agent's acting in some world so it can make actions. And when it makes an action in the world, uh, it receives an observation 
and uh, reward, okay? How good was it that you made that action, okay? And really, all the framework, uh, all you want to do in this framework is try and maximize or get the agent to learn to maximize the sum of the rewards it gets, okay? Very simple, really. And there's lots of different methods that you can apply to try and get an agent to do this, but they all sort of fall under this reinforcement learning framework. Um, RL, uh, you can see from the graph up here, this is the number of uh, uh, ac you know, academic papers beyond a certain amount of citations in reinforcement learning, and you can see it's going up, 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 up. I actually don't know what happens after this because it's an old paper, but uh, my inkling would be it kept going up, and then uh, in recent years it's sort of tapering off, I imagine, because everyone's just talking about LLMs. Um, but still really interesting. I also think it's interesting that OpenAI, um, even though they invented a lot of these cool systems to do with reinforcement learning, they've really just dropped off the radar when it comes to you know, putting out RL papers and things like that. All right, so um, just as an example, this is the Atari paper from uh, 2015. This is what they gave the learning system. You know, it's an observation or a state, uh, and it's just a bunch of pixels. Okay, that's it. Um, I'm going to gloss over some technical details. It's not completely true, but that's effectively what it is. Okay, they were showing uh, an agent uh, an image, and they were saying, "Make an action, and we'll give you a reward." And in this paper, they were saying the reward was just the score in the game. Okay, so the system was trying to learn to make the score go up. That's all. And just by doing that, um, amazingly, reinforcement learning is a pretty cool framework, and the algorithms are pretty good. This is an algorithm that was invented a few years ago that uses RL on Atari games. You can see it just plays the Atari games really well. Okay, uh, even even games that were difficult in 2015 uh, are pretty much mastered now by uh, modern algorithms. Uh, this is from a, a model-based approach called Dreamer 2. If you're at all interested in RL, I'd check out the paper, it's very cool. All right, so I want to explain two things uh, to you today and really bake two things into your head. One is the idea of a policy and one is the idea of a value function. Okay, so we're gonna talk about these now. Now, a policy in RL, um, it's a function and it takes a state, okay? So given a state or given these pixels, of the Atari game, what action should you take, okay? And you can have a deterministic policy, so given this state, I will always do this action, or you can have a stochastic policy, which is I give you a state, okay, and you give me an action distribution of what actions you should take in that state, okay? And in this work, I use stochastic policies. But whenever I say policy, you can just think, okay, it's what action I want to make, okay? What action I want to make. A value function is how, again, okay, so it's a function. It takes a state, just like the policy. But instead of it returning an action, it returns how valuable that state is, okay? How good or how bad that state is. Formally, it's um, the amount of expected rewards the system's going to get from that point onwards. Okay, so if you're in a good state, okay, you're gonna get lots of rewards. If you're in a bad state, like uh, you're playing Space Invaders and you're about to die, that's bad value, okay? You don't wanna be in that particular state. Okay, so there's lots of different uh, types of algorithms, as I mentioned before. Uh, the, this is stolen from, I think, David Silver's slides on RL. Here's a really good uh, series of lectures on YouTube if you wanna check them out. Um, very broadly, there are some algorithms where you're gonna try and train a policy, okay? Uh, they're called policy-based methods. Others try and uh, learn a value function. So, you know, learn how good or bad a state is or learn what to do in a particular state. And there are model-based approaches as well. Um, in this uh, talk, I use an actor-critic algorithm and that simultaneously learns a policy, so what actions to make in a state, but it also learns a value function. So generalization is hopefully obviously important. This is the uh, car example I was mentioning before. Um, if we are training systems to do basically any task, ideally we would want them to generalize to unseen situations. It's you know, quite obvious to us humans, but 
computers struggle with this. So if we trained you know, self-driving cars, say, on an environment like this, where all the streets are basically empty, okay, uh, maybe there's a few cars, but all the intersections are at right angles, um, we would hope that it would be able to generalize to an unseen situation with maybe more people, more cars, and maybe different streets, okay? Obviously, that's uh, you know, clear to humans, but it's not clear and it's very hard for um, uh, computers to do this. Uh, so proof of why and how computers are bad at this, this is a really cool paper. Um, this, again, is an Atari game. It's called Breakout. And this is what Breakout looks like. It's uh, A up here. And even as humans, humans are really clever, you've all probably figured out what you have to do in this game just by looking at a few pictures if you haven't played it before. You've got a paddle here. It goes left and right, and you have to hit a ball and destroy all the tiles. And you can train an RL agent to do this, and it's like really good, and it gets all the rewards, and it's like super clever. But then if you change even just a tiny thing about it, like in this case, they've moved the paddle, the researchers just moved the paddle up a little bit. It just can't play the game anymore. It has no idea what it's doing. And it's just like moving the paddle and like not getting any points at all, okay? So it's like so clear to a human that we would be able to generalize across all of these different changes, but these agents um, don't. So um, what people did to try and uh, evaluate how uh, well agents are generalizing. There were some benchmarks that were invented. Um, this was the benchmark that uh, I use for my thesis. It's called the Procter and Benchmark, made by OpenAI. They don't care about it anymore, though. Um, it's 16 different games. And every game is procedurally generated and has a seemingly infinite amount of levels. Okay, And that's important because it means you can separate a training and a test set like you do in supervised learning, but for reinforcement learning. So you could say, we're going to train the agent on the first 200 levels, and then we're going to evaluate or test it on the next 200 levels. So you've got different distributions that you're testing and training. Okay? So if it's trained on the first 200 levels, you want it to also do well on the other 200. Uh, this is an example of just some of the different levels. Okay? So even though it's the same game, this game's called Boss Fight, um, you can see the backgrounds are different, spaceships are different, the shooting patterns are different, colors are different, agents are different, okay? But the core mechanics are the same. All right, so uh, you're, all, you're all like uh, at least somewhat interested in machine learning, so you might be familiar with some generalization methods for like supervised learning, such as uh, dropout, regularization techniques, and other things. I won't go into it too much, um, but there are a plethora of different things you can do to try and get your models to uh, generalize. What I'm really interested in, though, is uh, bootstrapping human cognitive biases onto learning systems, because I think humans are the best, and computers still have a lot to learn from us. So in this uh, work, I was trying to leverage this human cognitive bias called inattention blindness. And um, it's sort of this phenomenon where, I don't know if anyone's checked out this YouTube video, it's pretty cool. Uh, you've got, uh, in the YouTube video, if you watch it in your own time, it, the YouTube video will say, it's by, made by a bunch of cognitive scientists, they say, can you count the amount of times that the ball gets passed between the you know, players wearing the white t-shirt, and you count, and no one actually notices there's a gorilla that walks through the middle of it, despite it being right in front of us. And I, I have to admit, I fell for this as well. I, I couldn't see the gorilla at all, which is amazing. And this bias just sort of you know, suggests that humans, we have an ability to focus on particular areas or particular ideas or concepts, but we can be blind to things that are right in front of us. So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to try and use this sort of human cognitive bias in attention blindness and bootstrap it into um, uh, these learning systems. This, this is just in here for the, for the seminar I had did before. Research questions are boring. Consider big fish, okay? So this is one of the proc gen um, environments. This is actually my favorite environment, um, or game, whatever you want to call it. It's like a video game, but only computers can play it, okay? Um, in this one, you play this uh, little fish here, the green one. You move up, down, left, and right. You've got to eat small fish, and you have to avoid the big fish or you'll die, okay? Um, so 
I'll just quickly get you to consider how would you play this game. In particular, um, what would you think about for determining a policy? Okay, where on the screen would you look to figure out what action right, you're going to make? And then also, what would you think about um, to figure out the value of the state? How much points do you think you're going to get from this state? Are you going to get like two points for eating two fish or three points for eating three fish? Think about like where on it are you actually looking? Now, for me, because I know how the game works, and I know the game mechanics and everything, when I'm thinking about a policy, I actually think it's probably most important to look kind of where the fish is. Okay? <laughs> it sounds stupid, but uh, a lot of learning systems these days, they just look everywhere, and they have to try and find a function that maps all the pixels everywhere um, to making an action. And I'm trying to sort of rethink this to get it to focus on just a particular area. Uh, so just very quickly, this is my uh, results. I'll see if I can get it to play. Shout out to my sister who uh, um, formatted these videos for me. Um, this, this is uh, the base method. The Impala method is the, is the baseline, okay? And it's just trying to map all the pixels to a policy, okay? And where we, you can see it sort of lighting up, that's where the neural network is thinking, okay? That's what it's using to make a decision. So you can see in this one, it's sort of overfitting a little bit. There's like this region's just lighting up for like no reason. And then like up the top, it's just like, it's kind of like looking everywhere, okay? To figure out what action to play. Now, I'm not sure if I, just and bias myself, but I think my way sort of focuses on the fish a little bit more. Um, and you can sort of see it as the fish moves around, sort of tracks it a little bit more and is sort of blind to other regions. So how do I do this? Um, actually, well, my idea, even before I knew about inattention blindness and everything, um, was to split a single player game into actually a multiplayer game because I kind of like coming up with like fun, stupid ideas, and that was my idea. How can you make a single player game a multiplayer game? Well, I was thinking if you have the screen, you, very loosely you can imagine this is the screen, and you just have, you split up into different sort of uh, grid squares or patches, and then you could just have agents looking at sort of each patch. And depending on if there's relevant stuff here or not, you might be confident in your ability to estimate an action or not confident. So all, even though all these, these agents are the same, they're the same brain, they're looking at different information. And they all have a confidence and they all have an estimate of the value and the estimate of the policy. Okay? And then we can sort of aggregate all of these uh, policies and values um, based on their confidences to get a sort of global policy and a global value and uh, That's what I did. It's kind of a simple method. This is an example um, So this this one's called dodgeball um, You got to play that that dude with the little soccer ball and you have to sort of throw the soccer ball at all the enemies and then you have to get to the uh, Square down the bottom to exit So if you imagine you're looking at this part of the screen well that part of the screen what does it want to do? Okay, if you were playing this game and you were just looking at that part of the screen, what would you do? Well, you know, maybe we think we're that guy up there, but we're not really that confident. So maybe we would say, okay, go down, that's the action. But my confidence is like 10, which maybe isn't very high. And then this one, it's like, well, now I'm looking at two agents. They kind of look the same. I kind of, you know, I don't think I'm one of them. I guess go down, I'm even less confident. Whereas this one, you know, is maybe a bit more confident. You can see the different players and, you know, maybe it knows what to do. So it has kicked the ball left, say, to try and kill that other guy. And then this one's not confident at all. It doesn't, can't see anything. So if you sort of aggregate and weight all these things together, you can get a global policy of what to do. And the idea is I'm trying to leverage CNNs, translation invariance, and uh, locality in decision making. So it doesn't matter where you look. If you can see the guy with a soccer ball, 
you're going to act the same way, right? Your decision making is invariant in terms of translation. All right, so if you do this, this is uh, my method. I call it spatially localized confidence, or SLC. You can see on the training set, um, it's actually quite similar, okay? Marginal improvement over the baseline. But what's interesting is it's quite a big improvement on the test set, okay? So constraining and using uh, sort of this confidence approach, just like making it, forcing it to focus on these particular areas and be confident on one particular agent, it's actually quite useful in terms of generalization. And these are all the games. So you can see some games, yes, actually it helps a lot, okay? If you look over the, on the right with the tests, focus on that. There are some games like Big Fish, Dodgeball, where this method just does a lot, 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 lot better. And it makes sense, okay? Because in Big Fish, you don't need to look at the whole screen. You just need to look at the fish. It just makes sense. The issue, though, is with uh, uh, games that are, have an agent-centered view. So in ProcGen, some games are non-centered, like Big Fish. The fish actually just moves around the screen. But there are other games, this one's called Ninja, where the agent actually stays in the middle. And he can jump around and shoot bombs and things, but he actually stays in the middle. Now, the problem here is, of course, if we have different patch views that are always trying to find an agent and think about what to do, well, in this case, it's always going to be the center agent that should have the highest confidence. And it would actually have to learn, the system would have to learn that um, it needs to always be correct. And all these other agents that are sort of around the screen just might be confusing the matter. Um, and here is an example. So again, agent-centered on the left, uh, non-agent-centered on the right. So my method definitely works better on uh, non-agent-centered views just because of how the problem is set up. Um, the next thing I did in uh, my thesis, I was, I was really sort of interested in, you know, puzzles, these maze-like games, it seemed like my method would be bad in these maze-like games because just by looking at the guy, you can't really decide what to do uh, because it's a complicated maze, okay? Or in this game, you have to get the key and then unlock the door. So you can't just like hyper-focus on one area. Uh, it actually makes sense to kind of look at everything and maybe the Impala baseline would do better. How could I sort of improve my method? And I was I was still hell-bent on this like multi-agent kind of approach. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if these like agents could communicate with each other, <laughs> okay? So we split a single, a single agent uh, task into a multi-agent task and letting them communicate with each other sort of as a bottleneck. So uh, hopefully that can improve generalization. So agent B could say, can you see the blue key to that agent? It could respond. Yes, you know, yes I can. And then it could use that in the decision-making process. Uh, so vision transformers exist, and that's what I decided to use to um, do this. Again, if, you know, this is actually sort of what uh, LLMs are based on, uh, the transformer model. This is just, imagine it, the same thing with uh, vision. So what they do is they actually split up an image into patches, which is what I'm doing. And then they make each one of these patches a you know, token in the language model, say. We put a position encoding with them because transformers, by their nature, they lose any sort of positional embeddings. We feed it into a transformer. That's the communication layer. It's just a bunch of matrices times together. It lets them communicate. And then we get out of it uh, more context. Okay? So the same sort of patches, but now they have context of all the other patches. And if we do this, um, you can see the uh, transform model is the one, well, actually, the base transform model is terrible. It's awful. But if you combine it with um, my localized confidence, it's actually the best. It's, it's pretty cool, OK? Uh, oh, and you can see it's done a lot better on maze-like games, which I was super impressed by. So minor, maze, and I think one or two of the others, we had huge performance gains by doing this as well. And these are some of them, for example. Cool. 25 minutes. So generally speaking, um, I'm pretty happy with the results from all this work. I don't know if there's any RL researchers in here, but RL just in general seems pretty hard to actually like get good results. 
um, because well, it's just a really a hard problem. And there's a lot, a lot of stuff that can go wrong. And everybody's sort of in this rat race of just like trying to find like one little tiny thing they could change to make a line go a little bit higher than another line. Um, but I was pretty happy with the uh, weird ideas that I came up with. Um, and it really got me interested in sort of human cognitive biases and um, uh, inductive biases in general. Uh, so it's been a really, really cool project. If you're interested in any of this stuff, definitely um, come talk to me afterwards. I'm a big nerd when it comes to inductive biases. And um, I'm really into metacognition. And I'm going to Europe next year, and I'm going to be meeting up with some uh, uh, metacognition researchers in Belgium, which is, uh, I'm really excited. And you know, all, all of my passion sort of grown out of this project, so I'm very, very happy. Um, I think that's it. So thanks all for listening. I can take some questions now. Um, sounds like not too many people are hiring. I did just finish my uh, master's though. I am looking for a job. If you do want to ever contact me about anything, even if it's just make stupid projects, hit me up. I love making stupid projects. Um, I have a website with some more stupid projects, axel.town. You can check those out. At the moment, I'm trying to master the game of Scrabble. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to enumerate you know, the highest possible Scrabble score game possible. That's my like thing I'm nerding out about at the moment. Um, these are my Daruma dolls. Um, I got to, uh, my minor thesis was coloring in, uh, was a big goal of mine, and I got to color in its eyes the other, the other month for finishing that goal, so I'm really happy. The, the white one there is uh, my fitness goals, and I don't have any eyes colored in yet, so that's a bit, a bit disappointing, but hopefully I can get those done soon. All right, I'll take some questions. Anybody have any questions? Yep. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. Um, we were talking, you, you used the Ninja Mod uh, game before as an example of a situation with an uh, asynchronous model yep. where you need that improvement from the transformer. But I noticed when you um, showed us the second table of test results that the Impala policy actually still seems like uh, slightly. No, so, um, no, so the agent-centered models, uh, agent-centered games um, just, they're kind of like an adversarial case in my model because okay. kind of goes against the, what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to say the region that you should be looking at to make a decision changes on the screen. Like it should be changing. So in big fish, for example, when the fish is moving around the screen, that's good for my model, okay? Because I can focus on it, forget about irrelevant details um, and just focus on what matters. But with things that have the agent centered, it kind of just everything breaks down because there is only one spot that I'm supposed to be looking. So yeah, uh, it's just kind of like a hard case, those ones. What I wanted to highlight here was just maze-like games. The transformer model does better on maze-like games. So you know, these aren't agent centered. The agents move around and walk around with maze still, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you can like RL is just like a versatile framework you can use to solve basically. If you define the problem well enough, it can solve in lots, can almost anything. Can, can you make money? Example. Sorry. Can you name one possible example? Because of course, in games, nobody dies there. Okay. I mean, ro I mean, robotics, right? You could, you can. They in like 2004, they used uh, reinforcement learning to figure out how if you if RoboCup is like this game where robots learn to play soccer and they play soccer against each other. They use reinforcement learning as, for example, to get the uh, IBO robots to figure out a policy for how to run across the room that, as fast as possible. Okay, so that was an example of like real world robotics from like 2004. That's before deep learning and everything. They just, they managed to get these things to work really, really well and come up with uh, a way of running that they as humans couldn't have come up with. It looks stupid, I think. It was like dragging its butt on the floor or something, but it, you know, it w worked. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, I was just considering, like you were saying, the, when it's um, aging and aging centric, you, your application is not working as, as you yeah. expected. But my, my, my thinking was that if you divide, if you, the principle is if you divide into multiple sections, yep. and each agent will give you a continent. Yep. Would it make sense that if a cent, well, it doesn't matter because if you are in centered, probably, I, I imagine, like, your probably your confidence will be higher 
and then you will start getting more results at this high, and then yeah, it, you're. And then we, yeah. I was confused why why wouldn't that work? Because if you if you are you you divide you are not looking at the whole thing. You are not focusing in one place. If you only care where is the one that gives you the highest confidence, so whatever that gives you the highest confidence, you got the center. That will that will give you the highest. Yeah, no, you're right. And what, what's interesting is like the training plots. This is the training plot. It, it actually just kind of performs at the same level as the baseline, which is kind of interesting. Like you would maybe think, and I was maybe thinking that it would do worse or significantly worse because of the agent-centered view. But what you're saying is sort of true, where it kind of can just learn that all the other agents don't matter and just to look at the, the center one. So. It's kind of interesting, you know, neural nets are just weird and it's hard to, you know, figure out what they're doing sometimes. And even if you have a hypothesis, you think it would do badly and a lot of the time it does it's better than you think it will. So, yeah. Uh, yep. Um, so, when PC research, this must have been super pumped when you got these results set up. Oh my God. Yeah, I had like a mental breakdown <laughs> um, like a month ago. I haven't touched AI in like a month, but yeah, <laughs> it was good. The grid? Yeah, for the, uh, for the different agents. Oh, like, you know, different agents, like patches? Yeah, yeah. Um, the patches, sorry, the patches. Did you look at um, the resolution of the patches or changed anything like that? Uh, so the proc gen is 64 by 64 by three color channels. And technically, they, the observation goes through a, an encoder. So it's like a feature view. It's not actually, I didn't mention this, but it's not actually pixels at this point. It's like a smaller feature view that's five by five by 64. I have it here. So yeah, it's, uh, oh, I'm sorry, eight by eight by 32 transforms into a five by five. And so I use 25 agents sort of looking at these different feature views. So it was like 25 agents were getting like a sort of big picture of the uh, of some localized area. So CNNs have a receptive field and the more you stack them, they, uh, the bigger the receptive field gets. So even though uh, uh, they're, they're, they're sort of overlapping, if you, if you sort of imagine, if you're looking at the observation here, it's like you've got, you're focused on one particular area, but you've got some like peripheral vision. And then you move over one, and again, you've got some peripheral vision. So that's also maybe why, you know, these agent-centered games, it did well, because the one in the center can still has some peripheral vision over everything it has, because there's like this CNN base. Yep. So just uh, one question. Um, so you have the yeah. Yeah, I, you can, you can, you can do it. You can do anything. I, I messed around with like you know, twenty different model arc model architectures and things. But I only, I only ever use these proc gen environments. I didn't ever try them with. Oh, actually, that's not true. I tried them on Atari games as well, and I tried them with a few other algorithms and a few other methods. But for the last year, this is kind of just what I've been doing but yeah you can change the network architecture you can plug things in the main thing is to have confidences it turns out this confidence having a confidence over your own estimates is really interesting and that's i'm really interested in it and humans do it all the time it's called metacognition we can do a task but we also have an estimate of how good we think we can do the task if that makes sense and how can you use your estimate of how well you think you can do a task to influence the actual task it's, you know, it's interesting. Yep. Uh, you know, when you're making uh, problems with the live learning, we have like a classification that has a sequence in there. Have you tried like using some of uh, these more, like faster reuse, like reshaping the problem uh, in both of the reinforcement, in the reinforcement learning and have it done really better on, on CD that is outside the data set? 
for sequence data? Is that what you're saying? Uh, like we have a sequence. Uh, if it would always give an estimate as for why it's learning more, it basically gets confined into the data set that I give it within that. But have you tried the, if, if for example, it's even odd numbers, simple problem. Uh, so it can't know how the data set would give it. But have you tried using it um, like some kind of like data assessment learning in problems like this and sort of basically uh, help? How Have you seen like how improve well, that, that's what ProcGen does. You train on a set number of levels. Sorry if that, this wasn't clear. So in ProcGen, you train on like the first 200 levels, and then you test it not on those 200 levels that it has seen, on a different set of levels of the same game. I was saying it looks totally outside. Yes, it's a different, yeah, different levels, different colors, different shooting patterns, different. They try and make them, it's all procedurally generated, so they can do this. But that's the idea. They're, tr they're trying to split a single game into a training and a test set. That's what they're trying to do. And there's a few different frameworks, or uh, libraries <laughs> that you do it. Uh, yep. Limited time to, to go on a basis. Oh, yeah, God. Yeah, no, I'm so, I'm so over this. <laughs> yeah. Hey, do, we have, do we have time, Lizzie? Is this? Um, maybe one or two more. Okay. No. Uh, in fact, the, the whole transformer thing was just like this. I have a month left. I'm just going to give it a go, see what happens. Just running like one set of these experiments takes like a week of compute time. RMIT doesn't have much compute. Uh, uh, so, you know, it was very much like, oh, I've got this idea. Let's make them communicate. Vision transformer, bang. And wait a week. Oh, wow, it kind of worked. Don't have time to do anything else. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, no, I, I could, uh, like a year ago I spent ages just changing the smallest things and uh, blah, 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 I'm, I'm sick of it, <laughs> so, 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 yeah, yeah, gosh, so glad, so glad, so, yep. Yeah, um, I think I wanted to go back to what you were saying before about the... Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. You, you've had a question, sorry, did someone over here have one? Oh, it's technical. It's just, co well, it's basic. It's, oh, I, I think it's because I like, didn't have like a, a max pool layer. If I had a max pool, it would have done probably pretty good. Yeah, because so. I would have thought that works quite well. So, because I was thinking in my head, like, damn, you need to use these transformers. Yeah, it's just because the, the number of parameters, or the number of, yeah, the size of the channels would, would, was huge and was having to learn from too much information. I think if I had a max pool in there, it would have looked fine. But again, running them takes a week, and then I just, I, I was running out of time. So I just had it in there as like a baseline, just to say that, you know, we'd be, we beat the baseline, basically. Yeah. Lizzie, out of time? I think we're out of time. Yeah, I'll talk to you later. Cool, thanks. <laughs>